Hey, and welcome back to the Installing Gen 2 Series Part 2. If you missed Part 1, what we did is we covered some basic networking. We started SSH so that we could remotely get in the system, uh, and we could do that while having the handbook on a web browser next to the terminal so that we can kind of quickly reference between the two. And then I also talked a little bit about uh, networking, IP addresses, net masks, and how to make sure your system is online. So if you missed any of that, definitely check out Part 1. Okay, so in part two, we're going to start off with block devices. Uh, block device is a fancy name in our case for a hard disk or USB key. There are two major types of devices, and it's character and block devices. So a character device comes in as a stream of data, and what that means is, is like, think of this microphone that I'm speaking into. The microphone has my audio in it, and it goes to my sound card, and it records my sound to a block device. Uh, so, for instance, I can't tell a character device, hey... Tell me what the audio sounded like five minutes ago. The character device only comes in as a stream, and once it's read, it's gone. Uh, however, I can ask the block device, hey, give me the last 50 megs of audio, because the block device stores all of that, and I can seek through it, and I can find different parts, and I can retain it for some uh, indefinite period of time. So in this case, our block device is going to be a hard drive where we're going to install Gen 2 onto. So now that we have a block device, we still have to divide it up. We're going to divide it up with things called partitions, which means I want to use a section of the disk for a purpose. So in our case, we're going to want a section of the disk for our operating system. Uh, some people divide it up into many partitions. So you might want, here's a section of the disk for Windows, here's a section of the disk for Linux. Uh, you could also divide it up and say, here's a section of disk for my operating system drive. Here's a section of disk for my home directory. There are many ways you can do it, and partitions enable you to organize your data and to tell the operating systems where things start at. So now that you have a partition, it doesn't mean you can actually write any data. In order to write data in the partition, we'll need to pick a file system. Uh, there are lots of different file systems out there with many trade-offs, but what they allow us to do is write data to the disk, uh, do things like list directories, and some file systems have different features and characteristics. So some file systems are really good with many small files, while other file systems are good at very big files. Uh, some file systems have capabilities to snapshot their data, to check for corruption, etc. And so there are a lot of choices out there, but I want to make sure that you understand that uh, partitions themselves don't make those choices. It's the file systems we put in the partitions. I also want to talk for a second about MBR versus UEFI. So as the industries progress, we used to always use MBR, which is the master boot record. Uh, the problem with it was is you could only have four partitions and the disks could only be two terabytes in size. That was really limiting for all the new and big computers and especially the enterprise deployments. So there's a new standard out, which is called UEFI, and UEFI can use GPT partition tables. These GPT partition tables can support a ton of space, can support uh, tons of partitions, and they're not very limited, but you do have to have new equipment to use it. For this guide, we're going to be using the bio slash MBR method because there's very little fuss to it. It works on everything, and there's some quirks with UEFI. Uh, UEFI makes sure that things are validated, that they're signed, and some of those signing keys are different on different motherboards. And so it causes people a lot of issues when they're just trying to figure this stuff out for the first time and learn it uh, because they may be working with all sorts of motherboards by all different manufacturers, and it gets hard for them to track down things. If we use BIOS slash MBR, it's going to work on everybody's system. We don't have to fuss with any settings or do anything. And so that's going to be the simple solution just to learn Gen 2 at this point. Okay, so let's go ahead and pull this all together. Your piece of hardware, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, is going to boot up, and on its motherboard, it has an embedded program, which is called the BIOS, and the BIOS is going to scan all the hard drives attached. Uh, those hard drives are what we're referring to as block devices. Those block devices, we're going to divide into partitions, uh, which are going to contain file systems. Our file systems are where we're going to store our operating system, our media, our web browsers, all the things we need to use the system. In order for the BIOS to boot off the block device, it's going to use either an MBR or a UEFI bootloader, which is then going to load our initial configuration in, which will describe how to load the operating system and partitions. In order to start installing Gen 2, we're going to need to pick a target drive. When I type fdisk-l, that's going to show all of my partitions. Uh, you'll notice I have a dev SDD and a dev SDE. So these are labeled alphabetically in the order that the BIOS presents them to the operating system. So most of you will actually see dev SDA. I just have a bunch of drives here. And one thing I wanted to point out is that dev SDE is actually an external USB SSD. So 
If you want to install Linux or Gen 2 and you don't want to mess up your main system or you're uncertain about if you're able to actually install Linux in the first place, uh, just plug in an external USB hard drive and install to that and then nothing gets actually modified on your real system and that's really handy because then you can also take it and plug it into another system uh, but your entire operating system stays unmodified so you can play around with things like that and that's exactly what I'm doing now so that way my main Linux system uh, still works, no problem. I can still dual boot and all that. And then when I want to boot into Gen 2, I can just plug in my USB SSD and I'm good to go. So let's go ahead and type fdisk slash dev slash SDE. On your system, it's probably SDA or SDB, uh, but make sure you get the right one. When we load it up, you can hit the P key and that will allow you to print the partition table. And so you can make sure that that's the disk that you're expecting and that everything looks right. Uh, in my case, I had a bunch of pre-existing Linux partitions here. So I'm going to hit D in the partition number over and over again until the disk is completely blank. And so I've deleted all the partitions. I type P again, and now you can see that there are no partitions and we have a fresh start to work off of. So we're going to go ahead and make our first partition. And you'll notice it starts at 2048. If you installed Linux a long time ago, that wasn't always the case. And the reason is, is because people didn't realize how big of impact it had on system performance. What we want to do is we want to start at 2048 so that we align the blocks with the underlying storage device. In our case, it's a USB device, but it could be a hard drive or whatever. If you were to pick an odd random number, uh, what would happen is every time you tried to read a block, the storage device would actually have to give you two blocks back. And the reason is, is because it wasn't perfectly aligned with its blocks. So we have our blocks, the storage device has its blocks. And if we align the partition, it means that when we request to read a block, that the storage device only has to give us one block back. Aligning our blocks will ensure we get the best performance out of our device. So the first partition is going to be the Grub BIOS boot partition. This partition is useful if you want to use GPT partitions with MBR uh, because basically it gives Grub more space to install its image into. It's not strictly required. However, all the Gen 2 documentation is going to assume you have this, and so it just makes it easier to follow along. So we're going to make this 2 megs in size, and we're going to make it Type 4 for fat, but we're not actually going to format it or anything. It's just going to be there, so if Grub needs it based on our configuration options, Grub can write its images there, and if not, it really doesn't affect our system at all. So now that we've made the Grub boot partition, we need to make the Linux boot partition. The reason is, is that Grub is a bootloader, and it can boot into multiple operating systems. So there's actually not too much Linux specific in there. So Grub is just as capable of booting into Windows as it is Linux. So we actually need a Linux boot partition for our Gen 2 install. Uh, we're going to go ahead and create that partition to be 512 megs, and we're going to use ext2. You could also use ext4. There's not really a big difference between them, although because the handbook recommends ext2, uh, we're going to go with that. The difference between the two is that ext2 doesn't have a journal, so it means if you hard power off the system, uh, the system may have to check the file system, versus with ext4, uh, it journals all those changes, so you don't necessarily have to manually check it. It should just auto-recover. Our next partition is going to be the swap partition. You'll find a lot of guidance online that says it should be two times the size of RAM, although that doesn't really hold true anymore. Uh, an example would be is, is that I've had servers with two terabytes of RAM. Uh, if you had a server with two terabytes of RAM, you don't want four terabytes of swap because that would take so long to read and write the data uh, that you would never actually be able to unswap and your system would crash anyways. So uh, in general, I would recommend having a very small swap partition because the minute you start swapping, all of your programs stop working the way you expected them to because the disk is so slow. So I don't care if you have the fastest PCIe disk uh, out there, it's still gonna be very slow compared to your RAM uh, because each time your CPU has to go, it has to load some instructions in, it has to go and reach out to the block device with an interrupt, and the whole cycle of issuing the I.O. commands is much slower than if you just hit the RAM. And so uh, we want everything to be in RAM, and so we're going to go ahead and pick 4 gigs of size. Uh, 4 gigs will be enough so that if I do something foolish, if there's an emergency, uh, whatever, the program is something unexpected, our system won't crash, uh, but also it's not too big where I'm just wasting disk space. Because if you're swapping out a bunch of gigs of data, your system does take a long time to read and write that data, and you're going to see a waterfall effect of slowness across the whole system, which we want to avoid. So last and certainly not least, we have the root partition. Unlike Windows, where you have a C drive, a D drive, and an E drive, Linux has a root partition where all different files are under. So for instance, your logs, your programs, your home directory and configuration files are all somewhere under the root file system. And the root file system is just a forward slash. So that's the base directory. The cool thing about this system is, is you get one single file system that can have many sub-file systems. So for instance, if you wanted to mount a RAM-based file system, 
in your own home directory, you could totally do that. So you could have like slash home slash Steve slash super fast and everything under that directory could be a RAM file system. Uh, and you can do that all without having to do any kind of magic. You just mount files under the root and they're accessible. And the same thing goes for like network file systems, or in our case, we made a boot partition. We're actually going to mount the boot partition inside of our root file system. So under our root file system slash boot is actually going to be our second partition for the boot drive, but it's all going to be totally transparent to the user. So the only way they have to interact with it is just changing to the directory, moving files in and out of the directory, uh, but it all looks the same. So it's that unified interface, which is actually extremely powerful, and you won't find that on things like Windows, uh, where it's much more of a legacy type approach. So in this last partition, we're going to go and hit N, make a primary partition, and we're going to let it just use the rest of the space in the disk, and it will default to Linux. And so that's all we really have to do, and now we can move on to making file systems. Okay, so we went ahead and set up our partition, but that doesn't mean we can actually use the drives yet. The reason is we need to put a file system on there. So the partitions reserve the space, but they don't put anything inside of them. And so if you were to try and read those bits and bytes right now, they'd be a bunch of random bits and bytes from whatever we put on there before, and it wouldn't make any sense to our operating system. So we're going to format the drives using the mkfs commands. Now before we do that, we need to talk a little bit about file systems. There's a whole bunch of choices here. Uh, we talked about ext2 and ext4 and how ext4 is a journal capability so that if the power goes out, it can automatically restore itself to a consistent state, whereas a non-journal file system wouldn't have that capability. Uh, there's also other file systems here like XFS. So if you get an enterprise distribution, the chances are it's gonna recommend you use XFS. The reason is, is that XFS works really well on servers with a lot of different cores, and it also is very scalable in terms of size. So XFS can handle hard drives up to 500 terabytes, uh, which aren't really commercially available today, but you have that forward-looking scalability. Uh, on the other hand, if you try and use EXT4 on anything greater than 16 terabytes, for instance, it won't work. So EXT4 has some uh, limitations, which won't really bite you yet, but in the future, if you get really big hard disks, it may be an issue. So for now, we're going to go ahead and use ext4 as our default file system because it's been around for such a long time. You'll find it almost everywhere Linux is. Uh, it doesn't corrupt your data, has some very sensible defaults, and it's just an all-around good file system. We're also going to use a swap file system for our swap drive. So if we kind of recap everything, uh, on our first partition, we don't even need to put on a file system because that's just used if Grub needs that space uh, for anything bootloader related. For our second partition, we're going to go ahead and use ext2 uh, because that's the recommended Gen 2 default, and it's just a simple file system that does the job on such a small volume. On our third partition, we have our swap drive. We're going to do an mk swap command on that, and that's going to put a swap file system on. And on our fourth drive, we're going to go ahead and make a file system for ext4, which is just our standard general use file system, which will work well for our purposes. Okay, so let's go ahead and type mkfs.ext2 slash dev slash sde2 and that's going to make the ext2 file system on our boot drive we're then going to run mkfs.ext4 on slash dev slash sde4 and that's going to make our root file system and then let's go ahead and run an mk swap on dev sde3 and that's going to make it so we can use that as a swap partition we'll also need to type swap on slash dev slash sde3 which will activate the swap for our configuration so we successfully made our partitions, made file systems in those partitions, and we're ready to mount them and install the Stage 3 tarball. Go ahead and click the link for the next video to get that process started, and thanks for watching.